This is chapter 4 of Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. It is titled, Tyranny is Tyranny. Around 1776, certain important people in the English colonies found that by creating a nation, a symbol, a legal unity called the United States, they could take over land, profits, and political power from favorites of the British Empire. In the process, they could hold back a number of potential rebellions and create a, a consensus of popular support for the rule of a new privileged leadership. Uh, this uh, describes the beginnings of the American Revolution. The Founding Fathers deserve the odd tribute they have received over the centuries. They created the most effective system of rational control devised in modern times and showed future generations of leaders the advantages of combining paternalism with command. Starting with Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, by 1760, there had been 18 uprisings aimed at overthrowing colonial governments. There had also been six black rebellions from South Carolina to New York and 40 riots of various origins. By this time also there emerged, according to Jack Green, stable, coherent, effective, and acknowledged local political and social elites. And by the 1760s, this local leadership saw the possibility of directing much of the rebellious energy against England and her local officials. It was not a conscious conspiracy, but an accumulation of tactical responses. The British, wooing the Indians, had declared Indian lands beyond the Appalachians out of bounds to whites, the, procl the proclamation of 1763. Perhaps once the British were out of the way, the Indians could be dealt with. Again, no conscious forethought strategy by the colonial elite, but a growing awareness as events developed. With the French defeated, the British government could turn its attention to tightening control over the colonies. It needed revenues to pay for the war and looked to the colonies for that. Also, the colonial trade had become more and more important to the British economy and more profitable. It had amounted to about 500,000 pounds in 1700, but by 1770 it was worth 2,800,000 pounds. So the American leadership was less in need of English rule, the English more in need of the colonists' wealth. The elements were there for conflict. A newspaper editor wrote about the growing number of beggars and wandering poor in the streets of the city. Letters in the papers questioned the distribution of wealth. Quote, How often have our streets been covered with thousands of barrels of flour for trade, while our near neighbor can hardly procure enough to make a dumpling to satisfy hunger? Unquote. The top 5% of Boston's taxpayers controlled 49% of the city's taxable assets. What seems, to have been, uh, what seems to have happened in Boston is that certain lawyers, editors, and merchants of the upper classes, but excluded from the ruling circles close to England, men like James Otis and Samuel Adams, organized a Boston caucus, and though their oratory and their writing, and through their oratory and their writing, molded labor class opinion called the mob into action and shaped its behavior. This, Gary, this is Gary Nash's description of Otis, who he says, quote, keenly aware of the declining fortunes and the resentment of ordinary townspeople was mirroring, mirroring as well as molding popular opinion, unquote. We have here a forecast of the long history of American politics, the mobilization of lower class energy by upper class politicians for their own purposes. This was not purely deception. It involved, in part, a genuine recognition of lower-class grievances, which helps to account for its effectiveness as a tactic over the centuries. In 1762, Otis, speaking against the conservative rulers of the Massachusetts colony, represented by Thomas Hutchinson, gave an example of the kind of rhetoric that a lawyer could use. Quote, I am forced to get my living by the labor of my hand and the sweat of my brow as most of you are and obliged to go through good report and evil report for bitter bread earned under the frowns of some who have no natural or divine right to be above me and entirely owe their grandeur and honor to grinding the faces of the poor." Unquote. This accumulated sense of grievance against the rich in Boston may account for the explosiveness of mob action after the Stamp Act of 1765. Though this act, uh, through this act, the British were taxing the colonial population to pay for the French War, in which colonists had suffered to uh, expand the British Empire. That summer, a shoemaker named Ebenezer McIntosh led a mob in destroying the house of a rich Boston merchant named Andrew Oliver. 
Two weeks later, the crowd turned to the home of Thomas Hutchinson, the symbol of the rich elite who ruled the colonies in the name of England. They smashed up his house with axes, drank the wine in his wine cellar, and looted the house of his furniture and other objects. A report by calling officials to England said that this was part of a larger scheme in which the houses of 15 rich people were to be destroyed as a part of a, quote, war of plunder, of general leveling and taking away the distinction of rich and poor, unquote. It was one of those moments in which fury against the rich went farther than leaders like Otis wanted. Uh, it is equitable that 99 rather than 999 should suffer for the uh, extravagance or grandeur of one, especially when it is considered that men frequently owe their wealth to the impoverishment of their neighbors, unquote. This is a, a quote from the New York Gazette at that time. The leaders of the revolution would worry about keeping such sentiments within limits. Mechanics were demanding political democracy in the colonial cities. Open meetings of representative assemblies, public galleries in the legislative halls, and the publishing of roll call votes so that constituents could check on representatives. They wanted open air meetings where the population could participate in making policy, more equitable taxes, price controls, and the election of uh, mechanics and other ordinary people to government posts. Uh, according to Nash, um, by mid-1776, laborers, artisans, and small tradesmen employing extra-legal measures when uh, electoral, electoral politics failed were in clear command of Philadelphia. Helped by some middle-class leaders, Thomas Paine, Thomas Young, and others, they launched a full-scale attack on wealth and even on the right to acquire unlimited private property. For the 1776 convention to frame a constitution for Pennsylvania, a privates committee urged voters that an enormous proportion of property vested in a few individuals is dangerous to the rights and destructive of the common happiness of mankind, and therefore every free state hath a right by its laws to discourage the possession of such property. In the countryside where most people lived, there was a similar conflict of poor against rich, one which political leaders would use to mobilize the population against England, granting some benefits for the rebellious poor and many more for themselves in the process. The tenant riots in New, in New Jersey in the 1740s, the New York tenant uprisings of the 1750s and 1760s in the Hudson Valley, and the rebellion in northeastern New York that led to the carving of Vermont out of New York State were all more than sporadic rioting. They were long-lasting social movements, highly organized, involving the creation of counter-governments. The Jersey rebels had broken into jails to free their friends. Rioters in the Hudson Valley rescued prisoners from the sheriff and one time took the sheriff himself as prisoner. The land rioters saw their battle as poor against rich. A witness at a rebel leader's trial in New York in 1766 said that the farmers evicted by the landlords, quote, had an equitable title but could not be defended in a course of law because they were poor and poor men were always opposed by the rich." Unquote. In North Carolina, Marvin L. Michael Kay, a specialist in the history of uh, the farmer um, revolt, uh, the regulators referred to themselves as, quote, poor industrious peasants, as, quote, laborers, the wretched poor, oppressed by, quote, rich and powerful designing monsters, unquote. The regulators saw that a combination of wealth and political power ruled North Carolina and denounced those officials whose highest study is the promotion of their wealth. They resented the tax system, which was especially burdensome on the poor, and the combination of merchants and lawyers who worked in the courts to collect debts from the harassed farmers. In the western counties where the movement developed, only a small percentage of the households had slaves, and 41% of those were concentrated to take one sample western county in less than 2% of the households. The regulators did not represent servants or slaves, but they did speak for small owners, squatters, and tenants. A contemporary account of the regular, regulator movement in Orange County described the situation. The people of Orange, insulted by the sheriff, robbed and plundered, neglected and condemned by the representatives and abused by the magistracy, obliged to pay fees regulated only by the avarice of the officer, obliged to pay a tax which they believed went to enrich and aggrandize a few, 
who lorded it over them continually. And from all these evils, they saw no way to escape. For the men in power and legislation were the men whose interest it was to oppress and make gain of the laborer. In the 1760s, the regulators organized to prevent the collection of taxes or the confiscation of property of tax delinquents. Officials said, quote, an absolute insurrection of a dangerous tendency has broke out in Orange County, unquote, and made military plans to suppress it. At one point, 700 armed farmers forced the release of two arrested regulator leaders. The regulators petitioned the government on the grievances on their grievances in 1768, citing, quote, the unequal chances the poor and we and the weak have in contentions with the rich and powerful, unquote. In another county, Anson, a local militia colonel, complained of, quote, the unparalleled tumults, insurrections, and commotions which at present distract this county, unquote. At one point, a hundred men broke up the proceedings at a county court, but they also tried to elect farmers to the assembly, asserting that, quote, a majority of our assembly is composed of lawyers, clerks, and others in connection with them, unquote. In 1770, there was a large-scale riot in Hillsborough, North Carolina, in which they disrupted a court, forced the judge to flee, beat three lawyers and two merchants, and looted stores. The result of all this was that the assembly passed some mild reform legislation, but also an act, quote, to prevent riots and tumults, unquote, and the governor prepared to crush them militarily. In May of 1771, there was a, de a decisive battle in which several thousand regulators were defeated by a disciplined army using cannon. Six regulators were hanged. Riots against the Stamp Act swept Boston in 1777, and leaders of the movement against the Stamp Act had instigated a crowd action, but then became frightened by the thought that it might be directed against their wealth, too. At this time, the top 10% of Boston taxpayers held about 66% of Boston's taxable wealth while the lowest 30% of the tax-paying population had no taxable property at all. The property list could not vote, and so, like blacks, women, and Indians, could not participate in town meetings. This included sailors, journeymen, apprentices, and servants. It took the Stamp Act crisis to make the, this leadership aware of its dilemma. A political group in Boston called the Loyal Nine, merchants, distillers, ship owners, and master craftsmen who opposed the Stamp Act, organized a procession in August 1765 to protest it. They put 50 master craftsmen at the head, but needed to mobilize ship workers from the north end and mechanics and apprentices from the south end. Two or three thousand were in the procession. Negroes were excluded. They marched to the home of the, the stamp master and burned his effigy. But after this, quote, gentleman who organized the demonstration left, the crowd went further and destroyed some of the stamp master's property. These were, as one of the Loyal Nine said, quote, amazingly inflamed people. The Loyal Nine seemed taken aback by the direct assault on the wealthy furnishings of the stamp master. The rich set up armed patrols as a result. Now a town meeting was called, and the same leaders who had planned the demonstration denounced the violence and disavowed the actions of the crowd. And when the Stamp Act was repealed due to overwhelming resistance, the conservative leaders served their connections with the rioters. Uh, they held annual celebrations of the first anti-Stamp Act demonstration, to which they invited, according to Hoarder, not the rioters, but, quote, mainly upper and middle class Bostonians who traveled in coaches and carriages to Roxbury or Dorchester for opulent feasts, unquote. When the British Parliament turned to its next attempt to tax the colonies, this time by a set of taxes which it hoped would not excite as much opposition, the colonial leaders organized boycotts. But they stressed, quote, no mobs or tumults. Let the persons and properties of your most inveterate en enemies be safe, unquote. Sam Ad Samuel Adams advised, quote, no mobs, no confusions, no tumult, unquote. And James Otis said that, quote, no possible circumstances, though ever so oppressive, could be supposed sufficient to justify tumults and disorders, unquote. Impressment and the quarter of troops by the British were directly hurtful to the sailors and other working people. After 1768, 2,000 soldiers were quartered in Boston, and friction grew between the crowds and the soldiers. The soldiers began to take the jobs of working people when jobs were scarce. 
mechanics and shopkeepers lost work or business because of the colonist boycott of British goods. In 1769, Boston set up a committee, quote, to consider some uh, suitable methods of employing the poor of the town whose numbers and distresses are daily increasing by the loss of its trade and commerce, unquote. On March 5, 1770, grievances of rope makers against British soldiers taking their jobs led to a fight. A crowd gathered in front of the custom house and began provoking the soldiers, who fired and killed first Crispus Attucks, a mulatto worker, then others. This became known as the Boston Massacre. Feelings against the British mounted quickly. There was anger at the acquittal of six of the British soldiers. Uh, two were punished by having their thumbs branded and were discharged from the army. The crowd at the massacre was described by John Adams, defense attorney for the British soldiers, as, quote, a motley rabble of saucy boys, Negroes, and mulattoes, Irish teagues, and outlandish jack tars, unquote. <laughs> Some language in there. Uh, perhaps 10,000 people marched in the funeral procession for the victims of the massacre out of a total Boston population of 16,000. This led England to remove the troops from Boston and try to quiet the situation. In the Boston Tea Party of December uh, 1773, the Boston Committee of Correspondence formed a year before to organize anti-British actions. Quote, controlled crowd action against the tea from the start, unquote. Uh, Dirk Horder says the Tea Party led to the coercive acts by Parliament, virtually establishing martial law in Massachusetts, dissolving the colonial government, closing the port in Boston, and sending in troops. Still town meetings and mass meetings rose in opposition. Yeah. And shut down the whole, shut down all of Boston for some tea. Um... Many of the Sons of Liberty, many of the Sons of Liberty groups declared, as in Milford, Connecticut, their greatest abhorrence of lawlessness, or as in Annapolis, opposed, quote, all riots or unlawful assemblies tending to the disturbance of the public tranquility, unquote. John Adams expressed the same fears, quote, the tarrings and featherings, this breaking open houses by rude, insolent rabbles in resentment for private wrongs or in pursuing of private prejudices and passions must be discountenanced." unquote. Patrick Henry was known for his oratory in Virginia, pointing a way to relieve class tension between upper and lower classes and forming a bond against the British. Uh, this was to find language inspiring to all classes, specific enough in its listing of grievances to charge people with anger against the British vague enough to avoid class conflict among the rebels, and stirring enough to build patriotic feeling for the resistance movement. Tom Paine's Common Sense, which appeared in early 1776 and became the most popular pamphlet in the American colonies, did this. Um, it made the first bold arguments for independence. It, in words that any fairly literate person could understand, quote, society in every state is a blessing, but government even in its best state, is but a necessary evil, unquote. Payne also writes, uh, I challenge the warmest advocate for reconciliation to show a single advantage that this continent can reap by being connected with Great Britain. I repeat the challenge. Not a single advantage is derived. Our corn will fetch its price in any market in Europe, and our imported goods must be paid for by them where we will. But the injuries and disadvantages which we sustain by the connect by that connection are without number. Any submission to or dependence on Great Britain tends directly to involve this continent in European wars and quarrels and set us at variance with nations who would otherwise seek our friendship. Everything that is right or reasonable pleads for separation. The blood of the slain, the weeping voice of nature cries, it's time to part, writes Payne. Common Sense went through 25 editions in 1776 and sold hundreds of thousands of copies. It is probable that almost every literate colonist ever yeah, either either read it or knew about its contents. Pamphleteering had become, uh, by this time, the chief theater of debate about relations with England. From 1750 to 1776, 400 pamphlets had appeared arguing one or another side of the Stamp Act, or the Boston Massacre, or the Tea Party, or the general questions of disobedience to law, loyalty to government, rights, and obligations. Payne's pamphlet appealed to a wide range of colonial opinion, angered by England. 
but it caused some tremors in aristocrats like John Adams, who were with the patriot cause but wanted to make sure it didn't go too far in the direction of democracy. Payne had denounced the so-called balanced government of lords and commons as a deception and called for a single chamber representative called for single chamber representative bodies where the people could be represented. Uh, Adams denounced Payne's plan as, quote, so democratical without any restraint or even an attempt at any equilibrium or counterpoise that it must produce confusion and every evil work, unquote. Popular assemblies needed to be checked, Adams thought, because they were, quote, productive of hasty results and absurd judgments, unquote. Payne himself came out of the lower orders of England, a staymaker, tax official, teacher, poor immigrant to America. By speaking plainly and strongly, he could represent those politically conscious lower class people. He opposed the uh, property qualifications for voting in Pennsylvania. But his great concern seems to have been to speak for a middle group. Quote, there is an extent of riches as well as an extreme of poverty, which by harrowing the circles of a man's acquaintance, lessens his opportunities of general knowledge. Unquote. Each harsher, more, uh, each harsher measure of British control, uh, the proclamation of 1763 not allowing colonists to settle beyond the Appalachians, the Stamp Act, uh, the Stamp Tax, uh, the Townsend Taxes, including the one on tea, the stationing of troops and the Boston Massacre, the closing of the Port of Boston and, and the dissolution of the Massachusetts legislature, escalated colonial rebellion to the point of revolution. The colonists had responded with the Stamp Act Congress, the Sons of Liberty, the Committees of Correspondence, the Boston Tea Party, and finally in 1774, the setting up of a Continental Congress, an illegal body, forerunner of a future independent government. It was after the military clash at Lexington and Concord in April 1775 between colonial Minutemen and British troops that the Continental Congress decided on separation. They organized a small committee to draw up the Declaration of Independence, which Thomas Jefferson wrote. It was adopted by the Congress on July 2nd and officially proclaimed July 4th, 1776. Uh, quote from this Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands, they should declare the causes. This was the opening of the Declaration of Independence. Then, in its second paragraph, came the powerful philosophical statement. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes uh, destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. It then went on to list grievances against the king. A history of repeated injuries and usurpations, uh, it, it goes on, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over the states. The list accused the king of dissolving colonial governments, controlling judges, sending, quote, swarms of officers to harass our people, unquote, sending in armies of occupation, cutting off colonial trade with other parts of the world, taxing colonists without their consent, and waging war against them, quote, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, unquote. Some Americans were clearly omitted from this circle of united interests drawn by the Declaration of Independence. For instance, Indians, blacks, black slaves, women, Indeed, one paragraph of the Declaration charged the king with inciting slave rebellions and Indian attacks. He has, ex he has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished obstruction of all, destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Twenty years before the Declaration, a proclamation of the legislature of Massachusetts of, seven, of November 3rd, 1755, declared the Penobscot Indians, quote, rebels, enemies, and traitors, unquote, and provided a bounty, quote, for every scalp of a male Indian brought in 40 pounds, for every scalp of such female Indian or male Indian under the age of 12 years that shall be killed 20 pounds, unquote. 
Thomas Jefferson had written a paragraph of the Declaration accusing the king of transporting slaves from Africa to the colonies and, quote, suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain this execrable co commerce, unquote. This seemed to express moral indignation against slavery and the slave trade. Jefferson's personal distaste for slavery must be put alongside the fact that he owned hundreds of slaves to the day he died. Jefferson's paragraph was removed from the was removed by the Constitutional Congress because slaveholders themselves disagreed about the desirability of ending the slave trade. So even that gesture toward the black slave was omitted in the great manifesto of freedom of the American Revolution. The use of the phrase, quote, all men are created equal, unquote, was probably not a deliberate attempt to make a statement about women. It was just that women were beyond consideration as worthy of inclusion. They were politically invisible. Uh, though practical needs gave women a certain authority in the home, on the farm, or in occupations like midwifery, they were simply overlooked in any consideration of political rights, any notions of civic equality. But the point of noting those outside the arc of human rights in the Declaration is not centuries late and pointlessly to lay impossible moral burdens on that time. It is to try to understand the way in which the Declaration functioned to mobilize certain groups of Americans and ignoring others. Surely, inspirational language to create a secure consensus is still used in our time to cover up serious conflicts of interest in that consensus and to cover up also the omission of large parts of the human race. The philosophy of the Declaration, that government is set up by the people to secure their life, liberty, and happiness, and is to be overthrown when it no longer does that, is often traced to the ideas of John Locke in his second treatise on government. That was published in England in 1689, when the English were rebelling against tyrannical kings and setting up parliamentary government. The Declaration, like Locke's second treatise, talked about government and political rights, but ignored the existing inequalities in property. And how could people truly have equal rights when stark with such stark differences in wealth? Locke himself was a wealthy man with investments in the silk trade and slave trade, income from loans and mortgages. He invested heavily in the first issue of the stock of the Bank of England just a few years after he had written his second treatise as the classic statement of liberal democracy. As advisor to the Carolinas, he had suggested a government of slave owners run by 40 wealthy land barons. Locke's statement of people's government was in support of a revolution in England for the free development of mercantile capitalism at home and abroad. Locke himself regretted that the labor of, the poor, labor of poor children, quote, is generally lost to the public till they are 12 or 14 years old, unquote, and suggested that all children over three of families on relief should attend, quote, working schools so they would be, quote, from infancy inured to work, unquote. English historian Christopher Hill wrote in the Puritan Revolution, the establishment of parliamentary supremacy of the rule of law no doubt mainly benefited the men of property. The kind of arbitrary taxation that threatened the security of property was overthrown. Monopolies were ended to give more free reign to business, and sea power began to be used for an imperial policy abroad, including the conquest of Ireland. Um, this is in England. The levelers and the diggers, two political movements which wanted to carry equality into the economic sphere, were put down by the revolution. In America, the reality behind the words of the Declaration of Independence, issued in the same year as Adam Smith's capitalist manifesto, The Wealth of Nations, was that a rising class of important people needed to enlist on their side enough Americans to defeat England without disturbing too much the relations of wealth and power that had developed over 150 years of colonial history. Indeed, 69% of the signers of the Declaration of Independence had held colonial office under England. When the Declaration of Independence was read, with all its flaming radical language from the town hall balcony in Boston, it was read by Thomas Crafts, a member of the Loyal Nine group, conservatives who had opposed militant action against the British. Four days after the reading, the Boston Committee of Correspondence ordered the townsmen to show up on the common for a military draft. The rich, it turned out, could avoid the draft by paying for substitutes. The poor had to serve. This led to rioting and shouting, quote, tyranny is tyranny, let it come from whom it may, 